Good evening, everybody. Welcome to PMI Victoria History Library. I'd like to welcome you all here today. I'm Judith, I'm President of the Library, and also a special welcome to our guest, Michelle, who's going to talk to us about Elizabeth MacArthur. The story certainly not known to me, and I suspect the story not known to many, if not all of you. Um, before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting this evening. Um, I was um, on the lands of the Wurundjeri and Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nation, and we pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Sovereignty has never been ceded, it always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Facilities for those that haven't been here before. Um, the bathrooms are back through the door of this room, do a sharp um, right, and they're just on the other wall there, basically through that wall. Um, in case of emergency, there are two exits. One is through this door, down the passageway, and will be directed outside, and the other is back through the doors that you came in, came in through, and of course, don't miss the lift. The library is the second oldest building, um, second oldest library in Victoria, mm -hmm. and it's founded in 1854 with its own act of 1899. And we collect all aspects of Victorian history, so that's what we specialise in. Along with um, any material from interstate or that is um, of an interstate or, in, or national um, interest, but it, it actually informs the history of Victoria, so we include that as well. There are about 40,000 40, items on site here, uh, most of which are available uh, for loan um, to members. And we're the only library in Australia with such a large loanable uh, reference collection. Um, so our core collection is local history, and we've also got information on most towns um, across Victoria. So um, Ellen will be taking, um, she's got a video running here, so she'll be recording the session tonight, plus there'll be some photos. If you don't want to be included in that, it's no problem, just let myself or Ellen know about that. We use that promotion on social media and our talks go up on YouTube after the event as well, so you can go back and revisit them if you choose. So I'd like to welcome Michelle Scott Tucker, the author behind the book Elizabeth MacArthur, A Life at the Edge of the World. And Michelle has some copies of this here tonight, if anyone is interested in purchasing this. <laughs> say. So Michelle's going to tell us all about the woman who established the Australian wool industry which is quite a feat to have to your name, even though, as we all thought, or all think, her husband actually got all the credit. Now, I did Google you, so a bit more about Elizabeth, about, about Michelle, sorry. Um, she's a professional writer and a senior consultant, having had a successful career in government, in business and the arts, including a stint as executive director of the Stella Prize, which some of you will have heard of, um, it's Australia's premium, um, or pre certainly preeminent, literary prize for women writers. And she's previously served as Vice Chair of the Writers of Victoria Board, as well as served on the board of Mountain Writers Festival. And I understand you think you have too many horses, so you might want to tell us about that a bit later. So I'll hand over to you, Michelle. Thank you very much. very much for having me. I'm going to talk for about 45 minutes today. I'm going to talk mainly about Elizabeth MacArthur, about who she was, what she did and why she's important. I'm not going to talk so much about my own writing process or my research process, but I'm guessing that some of you are writers and researchers, so if you've got questions about that, save them to the end and I'm, I'm more than happy to answer that. So to begin, 1766, that's the year that Elizabeth MacArthur was born which makes her a Georgian, not a Victorian. So she's a direct contemporary of Jane Austen, someone you might have heard of. And if you've read any Jane Austen or if you've watched any of those fantastic BBC bonnet dramas, you know the sort of look we're into, the, um, the high waist, very unflattering high-waisted gowns, not the Victorian with the big foof, the, the high-waisted beautiful white gowns. Mm -hmm. Let's see, there we go. There she is. We think that's probably her looking very decollete. That's a little miniature. It's only about this big in real life, so she didn't look quite so bosomy. In, um, you know, she wasn't always blown up to that sort of height. 
But if you can picture her in her Jane Austen outfit, and in fact in a Jane Austen village, if Jane Austen used to get pilloried actually for writing, they didn't call it fiction, they said it's too much like real life. And if you're familiar with the Jane Austen village, then you're absolutely familiar with the real life village where Elizabeth MacArthur grew up. It's called Bridge Rule. She was then Elizabeth Veal. Bridge Rule is in Devon, so in the southwest of England and right in north of Devon, right on the border between Devon and Cornwall. And in fact, the Tamar River, you might know, forms the border between Devon and Cornwall. And Bridge Rule sits right on the river. And the river sweeps around past a farm called Lodgeworthy. And that's the farm where Elizabeth was born. And I went there and took pretty ordinary photos. I apologise for that. Um, but that's the farmhouse where she was born. And I went up there in 2014 and I met the people who live there. It's still a working farm. It's about 100 acres now. Um, as I said, the river curves around one border. But it's set up, that house is set right up on a hill and you have to go up a long driveway. But at the bottom of the driveway, you basically end up in the village. And I'm telling you this for a reason that we'll come to later. The current owners of the house welcomed me in, made me the best Devonshire tea of my life. <laughs> it was just fantastic. And it was just absolutely lovely to see that place. But Elizabeth only lived there till she was about six. Um, and that's when her father died and also her little sister died that winter as well. And afterwards, we think Elizabeth and her mother, who was only in her 20s then, moved locally to live with her maternal grandfather. Um, and we know she also spent a lot of time at the home of her best friend, Bridget. Uh, Bridget's father was the Reverend Kingdon. He was the, the Reverend in um, Bridge Rule. And she and Elizabeth were absolute best friends, which is lucky for us because later they wrote to each other and we have those letters and that's been um, a really important primary source for some of the work I did. Um, and all very Jane austen to be brought up with the Reverend's daughter. Even more Jane austen a handsome soldier moved into town. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> He wasn't much of a soldier, and he wasn't necessarily all that handsome. <laughs> but um, Elizabeth fell in love, this by then she's about 22, and they decided to get married. In here, in St Bridget's Church in Bridge Rule. And again, I went into the church, and a lovely old man called Mr Bowden took me in with an enormous key and showed me around the church, and, and um, we were chatting away, and he, started, he took off his jacket, and Mr Bowden, are you okay? And he rang the church bells just for me to, to show me how it would have sounded um, on the day that um, Elizabeth and John got married in 1788. The village did not approve of the match. And I think um, our Elizabeth married a Wickham rather than a Darcy. <laughs> and the village thought he was much too proud and much too haughty for, for a boy that was effectively a shop. He was the son of a shop owner. He had no money. He had his commission, so he was technically a gentleman, but really only technically, not through any um, grace. And Elizabeth MacArthur wasn't posh either, and you've seen the house that she grew up in. It was a nice house, but she's not gentry. Later historians have tried to paint them as both being probably more upper class than they actually were, but you can see she's come from a pretty basic farming family. John MacArthur's come from trade, and they, as I said, they got married here in Ridge Raw. The village disagreed, but it was a love match. And the reason we know it's a love match, I'm very pleased you're sitting down because this bit's a little bit shocking. Five months after the wedding, Elizabeth gave birth to a bonnie baby boy. <laughs> um, we can laugh about that, but I don't know about your grandmother. My grandmother would have been counting back on her fingers and, and tut tut tutting about that. If Elizabeth had been less genteel than she was, maybe she would have got away with that. But, you know, you've read your Pride and Prejudice. You know how they felt about Lydia running off with her man. Um, Elizabeth didn't actually have the baby in the village. She was on her way to London with John, and she had that baby in a pub just outside Bath by herself. Her mother wasn't there. Um, and she took the baby and they kept going on to London and she didn't go back to the village. And I think, and I'm only guessing now, and this isn't in the book, but I'm guessing <coughs> she didn't want that speculation about how big the baby was for dates and she was trying to do what she could to, to fudge that situation. Um, John had decided to give up his so-called army career and um, become a farmer, but the army wouldn't let him go. They would later regret that. Um, they wouldn't let him go, and so then the least worst solution was to think about maybe going to this new garrison out in New South Wales. So Elizabeth and John got married in 1788. That's a date that should resonate for you. 
Uh, they got married late in that year. By early the following year, the ships from the first fleet that, of course, had landed in Sydney Cove in 1788 were starting to come back to London. And they're coming back with tales of how fabulous this new country was, that everything was going swimmingly well and it was all fantastic and the wheat was growing and a township was going to be built and it was going to be absolutely fabulous. And so the young MacArthur's heard this and thought, right, well, let's make our fortune. Let's go to New South Wales just for a couple of years, make a lot of money, come back and be farmers. I think they've got in their heads what happened to the first um, colonists who went over to India, the first people who were there managed to make a lot of money. I think if we're early on the spot, we'll see what we can do. And so they decided to go to New South Wales, which is probably a sensible decision for John, but why on earth would Elizabeth go? She's a young mum, she's got a baby in arms, no other women who were married to officers travelled on the second fleet. She was the only one. So why did she do it? I think, again, it's that baby that's big for days. Because if she has to go back to the village without her husband, where's John going? Oh, I'm New South Wales. <laughs> we'll be back soon. They're going to point. They're going to wonder about what's going on. She's a young woman. She's come to London for the first time. She's in love. This is a big adventure for her. And so she hopped on this ship. This is the actual ship that she got on, the Neptune, and embarked on what was probably the worst voyage of her entire life. So the Neptune was one of three ships in the second fleet. The first fleet you might know about, there were 11 ships landed in Sydney Cove. Of those 11 ships, only two of them belonged to the Navy. The rest were just um, hired by the government. It was an early example of government outsourcing, if you like. Um, and I used to be a government public service and I got very interested in the government outsourcing part of this and sort of went down a research rabbit hole to find out about the contractual situation and I'm not going to bore you with the details but I'll tell you the parts that you need to know. The first fleet was very successful and had a really good um, success rate in getting convicts alive and well to Sydney Cove. By the time the government decided to send the second fleet out they decided they needed to save some money because the first fleet was terribly expensive and you know nothing changes. They wanted to do it cheaper with the second fleet. So they used a different contractor. They used a man who's um, had made his money from the slave trade and the ships that they used were from the slave trade and the manacles that they used were still from the slave trade. Um, they, the contract was arranged so that the contractors were paid a certain amount for every convict embarked. So if you put a thousand convicts on the ship, you get a thousand times that amount and that amount has to feed them all the way from um, England all the way out to New South Wales over several months. This goes, um, my cousin's quite, she's here tonight, she's a super executive and she's a CFO and she's heard that word embarked and gone, oh, that's bad. <laughs> <laughs> that's bad because there's no incentive to get them to the other end. Yeah. And in fact, if they die on the way, they're going to eat less, aren't they? And if they eat less, there'll be more food to sell at exorbitant prices in New South Wales. And so that's exactly what happened. On this trip, the convicts were terribly underfed. They were smashed in to the holds to get as many of them in as possible, um, and they died like flies. And in fact, the death rate in the second fleet was about 33%. Oh, On later fleets, it came down to about 2 or 3% usually, as you'd expect some deaths along the way, but on this fleet, it was just the worst. So they're smashed down into the holds. They've got a bucket for stuff, but they're chained up most of the time. And they're at sea, so they're sick because you get sick when you're at sea. So nobody wants to be down there. Elizabeth, of course, wasn't in with the convict. She had her own teeny tiny little cabin, but she had a baby with her. She had a husband with her. There's only tiny partitions between them and, and the convict, so you can still smell everything that was going on next door. Just as she embarked and just as I was about to set off, she found out she was pregnant again. So she's pregnant and setting off across the ocean with a tiny little baby in her arms. Um, and the voyage was every bit as awful as you can expect. They made it all the way down to Cape Town where they paused for two weeks. And while they were in Cape Town, John fell gravely ill. Um, we don't know what he caught, but gravely ill. And they were only there for two weeks. And so when they set off from Cape Town, by now it's autumn because they were delayed in leaving um, England, they're going to set off from Cape Town across the Southern Ocean in autumn, which is the worst time of year to cross the Southern Ocean. She's got a baby who by now is about six months old. He's not been well for the whole trip. She's pregnant 
and she sets off with John and she writes about him in it, she keeps a journal. Every faculty was lost. Let's have a think about that when you're nursing someone at sea where every faculty is lost. It's not like they had an ensuite. <laughs> it's not like anyone was there to help her clean up. It's just her and her husband and the baby and it's all terrible. We know from the ship's logs that not only was it, you know, the Southern Ocean in autumn, which is pretty ordinary at the best of times, there were storms. There were terrible storms as they were crossing the Southern Ocean. And of course, well, some of you might have seen the Sydney to Hobart yacht race where they go down the coast of Australia. And you know when it's storming, you might have seen those pictures of those teeny tiny little yachts and the great big waves that they have to go through. Well, the Southern Ocean's like that all the time because they travel at about 40 degrees south where the westerlies prevail all year round. So it's halfway to Antarctica. So it's cold, it's wet. A wooden ship like that leaks. It's designed to leak. The planks overlap and they, they work. So there's always water coming through and then you just pump it out. So it's cold, it's wet. She's in a storm, the waves are like this. I have a friend who works in quarantine and he's done some work on the ships that go down and chase the, um, the pirate fishermen down in the Southern Ocean. And he makes a joke about it. He said he's in the gym on the ship because it's not quite like this. And he's on his exercise bike. He said, in the way you go up the hill, down the hill, <laughs> and up the hill, because the ship never stops. It's like this. So you never get to rest. You can't even, and then it's, it's rolling as well as it's pitching. You don't get to rest. You're getting thrown around. And Elizabeth got thrown around. <clears throat> and somewhere on that roaring, pitching, ice-cold sea, she went into labour prematurely. And we know this because she wrote a letter to her mother about nine months later. And it was just one line, and that one line she just said, I gave birth prematurely to a little girl who lived quite an hour. Um, and presumably she buried that little girl at sea somewhere on the Southern Ocean. A few weeks later, those three ships of the first, second fleet limped into Sydney Harbour in June. The people in Sydney were pretty pleased to see them because if you know your history, you know how well things went from 1788 to about 1790, which is not very well at all. The crops didn't grow. They couldn't, they had very little food and they were running out of ship stores. For two years there was no ships in the harbour. They didn't even know if the second fleet was going to arrive or not. So they were sort of pleased to see the second fleet, but much less pleased to see the convicts because they're no use to anyone. And particularly after this trip, they were no use to anyone. Some of them who'd survived the whole trip died when they got to Sydney Cove because they were just thrown overboard. They were just literally treated like cargo and dumped overboard. And, and Governor Philip was horrified, actually, and, and called it murder. Um, and Elizabeth arrives and the, the Marines come out to meet them and some of them don't have shoes on. They haven't been to London for three or four years. Their, their uniforms are threadbare. They're all really skinny because they haven't eaten properly. And she's looking at Sydney Cove and there's not this beautiful village that she'd expected to have waiting for her. There's not fields and crops waiting for her to make her money. There's basically a tent city. A tent city in the mud on what's now Sydney Cove with one sort of very ordinary house where the governor lived. And this is, she must have stood there on deck and just, oh, dear God, what have I done? She'd given up so much to come here and there's basically nothing there. And so she did what she would do for the rest of her life, which is she rolled up her sleeves and she just got on with it. She just got on with it. And despite that, for the next three years, she lived in that tent city. It wasn't all lovely and glorious and wonderful. She had a hut. She lived for three years in that tent city, pretty much bored out of her skull because there's nothing to do. There's no other women of her class to talk to. The convict women are there, the servant women are there, but the rules of society meant she couldn't really befriend them in any meaningful way. And it took a few years before a couple of other women joined the society. So she's got no one to talk to except for the officers. And because she was the only genteel educated woman in the colony, she was incredibly popular. <laughs> so it became quite the thing to visit with Mrs MacArthur and to chat with her and to see her most days. And she did little trips around the harbour because at that stage it's mainly the naval officers are in charge so they'd go on the day trips around the harbour and she'd collect shells and she wrote back to her friend Bridget how she was doing these trips and collecting shells but they weren't as pretty as the shells she used to collect with Bridget back home um, on the coast with her. It took three years before the MacArthur's finally got a land grant and were able to set up their own farm and I want to say land grant with air quotes because of course we know that it was someone else's land. It wasn't just there for the taking. 
because it just magically appeared. But the MacArthur's took their land grant in Parramatta. So if you know Sydney Harbour, and even if you don't, big beautiful harbour, and one of the rivers that feeds into it is the Parramatta River. So you can go now, and I've done this, you can catch a ferry from Circular Quay and go right up the river to Parramatta. It's beautiful, actually. It's lovely. And, and where Parramatta is is where the water is still fresh. And Elizabeth um, and John established a farm. Again, not posh. We think that's what the house probably looked like in the early days. And if you think back to what I told you about Lodgeworthy, the place where Elizabeth was born, she replicated it with, with her new place. It's on the river at Parramatta, about a kilometre back from the river, and it's bordered on one side, a big loop of the river around it. And this is up on a hill, and if you go down the driveway, you pretty much end up in the village of Parramatta. Actually, you end up where the garrison was, and then the village is just there. So it's not remote in any Australian sense, although, you know, she's on the other side of the planet and she might as well be on Mars. But she had people nearby. And this little cottage is basically where she and her family lived for the next 30 years. And she went on to have seven children in this little cottage. <laughs> um, over the next, let's say, five or six years, they started establishing a farm. And John, again, pointing towards that this was a love match, called this farm Elizabeth Farm after his wife. And it's still there today, and we'll see a picture of what it looks like today soon. But at Elizabeth Farm, they started growing fruit trees. They had poultry, they had pigs. They only had a couple of cows in the early days. Cows were a precious commodity in this new colony and there was few and far between. They had a herd that came out with the first fleet that they got away. <laughs> I'm kind of hoping the First Nations people had to do with that. But um, the, the cattle got away. Someone lost them and they never found them again until a few years later. And where they found them was about 70 kilometres southwest at a place they called Cow Pastures. And when they found them a few years later, the government decided, well, we'll just leave that as a commons area because it's beautiful, it's this lush pasture land, it's, it's prime land, the cattle have found what suited them best and they're too old for us to round up so we don't want to touch them anymore. Um, and, but Elizabeth did have a couple of cattle of her own and someone, in fact, gifted her a cow, a milk cow, and it was a gift beyond price for a mother with young children to have, to have a milking cow. Um, very few sheep in the colony at this stage and in the next few years, an officer did go to Cape Town and come back with maybe half a dozen merino sheep that were probably half bred something, and the MacArthur's had a couple of them. But at that stage, they really weren't focusing on sheep. They were just trying to diversify and make money in as many different ways as they could. So they were making money um, from the cattle. They had horses. Um, of course, John was engaging in an illicit trade in rum, so that's probably where most of the money came from. He also had a day job working for the for the government um, as an officer, so he had that money coming in as well. They were running ships out into the South Pacific to do trading trips. They were getting, investing in sealing things. They were diversifying as much as they could to try and see which, what would work for them. And this next picture was painted in 1859, and it's like the artist has made it up, basically, but it gives you a sense of the sort of countryside that we're thinking about. So that little house up there, I'm not going to use the pointer. <laughs> That little house there is the imaginary Elizabeth farm, and this is the Parramatta River here in the corner. Um, and now that's all houses and, and suburbs. But you can walk still from where the, the ferry lands, and you can walk up to Elizabeth Farm, and it, it's quite nice actually. But you can see the sort of countryside that she was dealing with. So let's talk about 1800. Let's get up to there. By this, by 1800, Elizabeth Scott, I think she's got six children by then. Um, one had passed away, a little boy passed away as well when he was one. He was called James and then she was pregnant with another child then and the baby that was born was also called James because, I don't know, she did that. Um, so by 1800 she's got lots of little kids. The oldest boy, the one that was big for dates, um, his name's Edward, when he turned seven or eight he got sent back to England to go to school because there's no schools in the colony. And I don't know about you, I have kids and they go out driving with their dad to the shops and my heart's in my mouth because I can't bear the thing of them leaving me alone. They're older and they drive their own cars now and my heart's still in my mouth. Um, but they sent that little boy off on a ship back to London um, to, to go to school all by himself. Um, and in 1800, John um, by then was very much involved in the running of the colony, very much involved in 
getting up the noses of his superior officers. He's a hard man to love, John MacArthur. He's, he's brilliant and really, really deeply annoying um, and managed to annoy his commanding officer to the point where they had a duel. The whole pistols at dawn, back to back, pacing out, turn around, duel, dead set. And it wasn't even his first. <laughs> he had a couple of these because the man's insane. Um, and he shot his commanding officer in the shoulder, which is not a career enhancing move at the best of times. <laughs> And the governor was so fed up with the whole shenanigans that he sent both of them back to England to be court-martialed. And just before he left, John, out of spite, basically bought, by this stage they had about 1,000 acres, they kept building out the farm. And by this stage they had about 1,000 acres, and so John, just before he's left, bought another farm of another 1,000 acres and then left with um, the oldest daughter and the second oldest son. He took them to England with him and left Elizabeth, see ya, bye, see you, bye. And she's literally got a baby in arms, she's got a toddler, and she's got a little girl who's about a primary school age. And now she's got a thousand acres here and another thousand acres up the road and a couple of thousand sheep. And she's, what does she do? She rolls up her heart sleeves and she just gets on with it. And so John wasn't back for four years of Elizabeth getting on with it. She's running the farm, she's making it work. And she's at this stage still got pretty good relationships with the local First Nations people. And in fact, one of her cows got away and a First Nations guy found it and brought it back to her and he had to sort of sneak it back because there'd been some family issues and his family didn't want to see him. But he snuck it back um, for Elizabeth MacArthur and his family caught up with him and they, um, he had to engage in a ritual spearing um, ceremony which took place within sight of Elizabeth Farm. And her son remembers standing on the balcony watching this ritual spearing happen. Um, and my thought is this spearing didn't go as it was meant to. I think it was meant to punish him, but in fact he was mortally wounded and Elizabeth took him in and had him nursed for the week it took him to die. Um, and he was buried within sight of the homestead. And this is where you have to look at your sources really carefully. He was buried within sight of the homestead. Well, previous historians have used that to say what a great relationship the MacArthur's had. Well, he might have been buried in sight of the homestead because this is his country. And that homestead's in a beautiful spot where families have probably been using it for the last 10,000 years because it is a beautiful spot. So, of course, he wanted to be buried there because this is his people's country. This is the sort of reading between the lines we need to do. Um, and over this four-year period, Elizabeth's building up the flock. She's doing what she can. John, meanwhile, in England, talked himself out of the court-martial, um, talked himself up as a seller of wool. Remember, it's 1800 and going up to 1804, the Napoleonic Wars are in full swing. The Industrial Revolution is just taking off and England can't get wool from, the, from Europe anymore because the wars that are going on and they need to source their wool from somewhere. And so John's walking around going, I'll do it. It's fine, I've got it. He hasn't got it. But he's, yep, yep, I've got it. So in 1805, he comes back in a ship that he bought and smugly called the Argus. It's got a, got a ram on the front because, you know, he's not subtle. Um, and on, that, on board that ship was Elizabeth's oldest daughter, who she's very pleased to see again. The boys stayed in England. Um, he's got half a dozen rams that he's bought from the king's own fleet. These are purebred merino rams that he's, he's bought from the king himself. Um, Banks actually refused, Joseph Banks, you know him, actually refused to sell them to MacArthur and, and said you can't take them out to Australia because you'd be breaking the law so John managed to get the law changed because that's how he rolled. Um, and he came back um, with a woman called, um, who would become uh, Elizabeth's lifelong friend. She was there as a governess for the children, but in fact she actually became a family friend and, and was very helpful to Elizabeth. And he came back with a piece of paper. And this piece, of, before this, the land grants that were given were 100 acres here, 200 acres there, blah, blah, blah. John's come back with a piece of paper saying, give this man 5,000 acres now and another 5,000 acres in a year or two if he does quite well. And the colony's got wood. And they said, well, give this man land wherever he wants it. And John's gone, I want it down at cattle pastures. I want that lush land that the cattle found that you're saving up for the colony. I'll take that, thanks. And the governor's just rolled over and gone, I surrender because I just can't be doing this anymore. And so he left. And John got these... 10,000 acres down at cow pastures, which he called Camden because the signature on the bottom of that was Lord Camden. And if you've been to Sydney, you'll know now that there's a town there called Camden about 7,000, about 70k southwest of Sydney. 
and it was the MacArthur's who established that area as well. So over the next three years or so, you'd think John would be pretty busy. He's got his farms up at Parramatta. He's got his farms down at Camden. He was busy, not so much farming as, as fostering political ferment, because the new governor who came in was called Bly. And if that name sounds familiar, it's because it is familiar, because you've all seen Mutiny on the Bounty. And it's the same Bly as Mutiny on the Bounty Bly. They didn't really know what to do with him because, you know, clearly the ship thing wasn't working so well for him, so they sent him out to be the governor of New South Wales. Excellent sailor, fantastic navigator, and like some many people who are really, really good at their technical job, he's much less good at dealing with people. Just not a people person, our Bly. Although the small farmers loved him, so Bly was sent in with a purpose. He was, had to break up the monopoly of the officers who'd been trading in rum and had been treating the small farmers really badly. And Bly's mission was to go in and break up that monopoly and to do things for the small farmers. And this, to be fair, the small farmers loved him. There was one small farmer who, who had a child at that time. Um, John Turnbull was the convict's name and his son was called John. And so they gave this the little baby the, mid, the middle name of Bly. And in that family, every oldest son has the middle name of Bly because of their gratitude for Governor Bly right down to the latest eldest son in that family, who you know, his name is Malcolm Bly Turnbull, the former Prime Minister. Mm. He's the descendant of that convict that was grateful to Governor Bly. Um, John MacArthur, of course, didn't get on with Bly. By this stage, John's left the army and he's trying to make money out of rum and Bly's trying to stop him making money out of rum. So long story short, military coup. Bly's arrested, it's called the Rum Rebellion. Bly's arrested. The military takes over and MacArthur's fingerprints are all over it, which would be great, but he should have been at home doing his thing because they've got the farm at Camden. Their eldest daughter at this point has grown grievously ill, something like polio. She's paralysed. They don't know if she's going to live or die. And at the age of 42, Elizabeth, kind of bittersweet, it's been eight years since she's had a baby, has found herself pregnant again. And they're the sort of facts you find when you go into biographies. It's like the reverse of the, of the embroidery. So the great man histories that we're all familiar with that say these are the political reasons for the wrong rebellion and blah, 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 they don't tell you what's actually going on in people's private lives to put pressure on them and the sort of pressure that John MacArthur was under at this stage. I'd also really like to have been a fly on the wall when Elizabeth found out what he'd done the next morning after the rum rebellion. <laughs> um, she didn't stay in Sydney long. She packed up and went back to the farm without him. Um, because he's basically put his head in a noose. Because the government in England doesn't look well on people taking over um, properly appointed governments out in the colonies. That's, that's treason, that's a hanging offence. And so again, he's dueled, he's put, his, he's put himself at risk. And again, eventually, after a couple of years pass, he and the other ringleaders get packed off to England to face trial. And this time, and again, he leaves Elizabeth home alone. This time he takes the two youngest boys with him, so Elizabeth's home alone with the little baby that she's just had um, and the girls. The girl who's very ill and is still gravely ill when her dad goes and, and another the little girl who's a teenager at this stage. And John MacArthur goes off to London and he doesn't come back for eight years. So in total there's a dozen years where Elizabeth's just doing it all. And she really is doing it all because by this stage their holdings are huge. So let's talk about sheep. We're using the hand clippers, remember, when it's none of this electric stuff, it's all hard work. We don't have a good workforce like this. You've got a convict workforce. This is before there's mass emigration out to New South Wales. You're just dealing with the convicts that you've got. And most of them are from the streets of London. They don't know how to shear a sheep. You've got to learn, they've got to learn on the way. They wash the wool when it's still on the sheep. So they don't shear the sheep and then send it off to be washed like would happen later. They actually wash the sheep first, presumably like dogs in the river. They set them up in the river and, and send them across and some poor convict stands up through his waist and spends the day washing the sheep and then you've got to wait for them to dry before you can clip the wool. And these sheep in the top corner, they're not just random sheep. They're descendants of the MacArthur sheep because there's a little flock of them still in New South Wales. And you can see that they're kind of little and scrubby. They don't look like the big merinos that we're familiar with, with the rolls of fleece and the big curly horns or something. They're just little scrubby monsters like that. Apparently they're very solid units. Um, and so these are the sheep and the wool that Elizabeth's dealing with. 
And it's during this period, in about 1814, when she and a couple of other farmers send the first commercial quantities of wool to London. She sends the first commercial quantities of wool to London. And having John on the spot is actually a huge benefit to their family because he can take it as it comes in and then use their broker and sell it and sell it on. And so he very helpfully writes her letters about the, about the wool. It's really dirty, can you make it cleaner? It's really not packed properly, can you do a better job? I'm really grateful to you, but the wool's really dirty. And of course it takes a year or six months for these letters to come back, so I hope she just looks at them and rolls her eyes <laughs> and just keeps doing what she's doing and trying to move things along. By this stage, she's, most of their work is down at this property at Camden, um, 70 k's southwest of Sydney, and so the frontier has moved. It's moved from around Sydney COVID, it's, and she's on the edge of this frontier down at Camden. And during this period, there are killings and reprisals on both sides, and she gets a bit less enamoured of her First Nation friends and, and hardens up because there's real money at stake now, um, real money at stake, and she needs them gone. And this is during the period there was a massacre in Appen called the Appen Massacre, when um, a fam the soldiers came upon what was, looks like it was a family camped at night and ran them off a cliff. Um, women and children and, and older men just ran them off a cliff and then managed to find one or two men who they could call warriors and they strung them up in the tree as, as, as a warning. Um, and Elizabeth wasn't directly involved in this, but she benefited from it because things went quiet after that. She benefited from it. Her family benefited from it. We benefited from it because Australia did so well off the back of the sheep. It's a hard thought to hold and, and to think about, but, it, but it, it's worth rolling that around in your mind. After seven or eight years or so, John comes rolling back, finally. Um, we had to work things out, and he comes back with the two oldest sons who are very keen to farm in Australia, but the two oldest boys, the farming's not for them, they don't want to do it. And so by now we're up to nearly the 1820s and it's a boom time. This is when sheep are taking off and the immigrants are starting to come to New South Wales and you want to come to New South Wales and you want to buy sheep. And who do you buy sheep from? You buy it from the MacArthur's. So you turn out, it's like a little Ponzi scheme. They say sheep are doing really well and then they can sell you a flock, off you go. Why did the Blue Mountains get crossed by white people? So they could find more land for their sheep. Where did they get their sheep from? From the MacArthur's and they're just selling it on and they're selling the wool and they're doing really well and John's doing really well and the sons take over the running of the business, always keeping their mother involved. They never discounted her. They always relied on her. They always needed her, for her advice. They were never, in any of their letters, they're never patronising or worried about her. Um, and she was always very interested in what was going on. And you'd think this would be a great time for her, the, the 1820s, but it's not because John's not quite right. And John's behaving very erratically during this period and Elizabeth starts stopping going out because John's just being embarrassing and just being a bit terrible. And he gets this bug in his head about renovating. And so that little cottage that you saw before at Elizabeth Farm, he renovates it. And he makes this beautiful, this is how it looks now, this is what Elizabeth Farm looks like now. And it's still a modest bungalow but it's just beautiful and he renovates it but it takes him years to renovate it. He keeps changing his mind and he's renovating other properties and in the meantime all the girls have to get out and they get back in and they get out and it's all going a bit, it's all a bit hard. And finally in the 1830s, to use the words of the time, Elizabeth John is declared insane. He's declared insane and he's locked up. First year he was with farming and down at Camden Park where he's building another house. And it, it's difficult to diagnose people in hindsight, obviously, but it, the consensus seems to be that he's probably bipolar. And he had these amazing highs and these really low lows and amazing highs and really low lows. And Elizabeth's weirdly modern about her acceptance that he's ill and that it's not him, it's the illness that's the problem. She kind of got that. Um, but for the last few years of his life, he wouldn't see Elizabeth. He was paranoid about her and he couldn't see her. And finally, he died suddenly in the early 1830s. And again, I don't say this in the book, but I suspect it might have been suicide. I've got no proof for that. But suicide rates against people, amongst people with bipolar is much higher than the general population. And the family all seemed a bit shocked that he died so suddenly. And he's not buried in a churchyard. He's buried on the family property down at Camden, which might have just been a thing that they did. But I wonder about it. That's all I have to say about that. So it's the 1830s and they've got this grown-up family and like, oh, 
grown up families with lots of money, they start arguing about it. So where are we up to? There's Edward, he joined the army, he's that baby who was big for dates. <coughs> Possibly gay. <coughs> Again, you can't know, but good luck to this handsome chap. John is the next oldest, John MacArthur, that's the son John MacArthur, and he went out, um, he left for London when he was a little boy, six or seven, and Elizabeth never saw him again. Oh. They wrote and they corresponded, but he died when he was in about his 30s. He never went back to um, Australia for a visit. Um, and he died, in fact, just before his father died, and it probably helped his father to die because his father took it really badly. So John MacArthur Sr. had seen John as an adult while he was in London, but Elizabeth never saw him again. And, in fact, she never had all her children under the roof at that one time. And then the two youngest boys, James and William, who were always really, really close. <coughs> They're the ones who really built up the farm down at Camden Park. They lived together in the house together. James got married, William didn't. Um, but the wife lived with, you know, had the brother living in the house and they all got along. So um, it was James and William who really cemented the family fortune, really, and, and built it up based on Elizabeth's foundations. And then there's the girls. Now, the librarians amongst you are going to feel for me with this because... I don't know which one's Elizabeth and which one's Mary because no one bothered to say which one was which because it's only the women and who cares, right? Right. Um, so there's Elizabeth, she's the one who got polio. Mary's the one in the middle. She did marry. Um, she married badly, um, an abusive relationship and had five children with her husband and talked about his cruelty and, and it was all pretty awful for her. And the youngest one, Emmeline, who was born just after the Rum Rebellion. We don't even have a picture of her, and yet she married the man who would become the governor of New South Wales. Mm -hmm. um, so after John's death, um, Elizabeth and her daughters all, all lived together. Elizabeth Junior predeceased Elizabeth Senior. So she saw three of her children die in her lifetime, um, which is pretty heartbreaking for anyone. Um, and the boys lived down here at Camden Park where she'd go to visit them. So you can see they've moved from having a quite modest little Elizabeth farm, now they've got the family seat at Camden Park. And the MacArthur's still live at Camden Park. Um, and they open it to the public once a year and I've met them and they're lovely and I, and I said to the current John MacArthur, he's heard me do this, this talk, and I said, I always feel a bit bad when I talk about the bipolar thing because I'm, you know, mate, I'm sure it's not hereditary. And he just laughed. He said, oh, yeah, no. <laughs> um, he's a lovely man. Still stonkingly wealthy, as far as I can tell. Um, and the house is beautiful. And so here we have Elizabeth herself. This is actually a photo, not um, a painting. It's a, a, a tinted photo. And so this is her in her old age. She's still always very interested in the, um, in the sheep and the shearing. And her family at this time had acquired a holiday house at um, Watson's Bay. So I don't know if you know Sydney, you've got the two heads, and behind South Head there's a bay called Watson Bay, and you catch the ferry up the harbour, it's beautiful, and you land at Watson's Bay, and you have your fish and chips, it's very nice. And there's a parklands that goes up. And their house was at the top of those parklands. So this is looking back down the harbour, and this road in front is Military Road. So behind us is the Pacific, and that's the harbour, and this house was there was their little holiday house. And Elizabeth used to potter around and, and talk to people and they'd take a chair for her and take it up to South Head. And she used to like watching the ships going in and out of the harbour. Because remember, she's seen that harbour empty. She's seen that harbour when they didn't know if another ship was going to arrive or not. And now here she is in 1850 or thereabouts, this thriving colony, the gold rush hasn't quite hit yet, but this thriving colony that she's been a player in. She knew every governor, from Governor Philip right through to the governor who was um, the governor when, in the 1850s, which I think was Fitzroy. She knew every one of them, not just knew them, she was friends with them. She made political decisions. At one stage when John was in England, he said, look, sell up the farms and come to England and we can live quietly here. And, and her letter is missing, but it's clear that she went, no, no, this is our place. This is where I'm staying. This is where I'm going to be. She talked about going back to England, but she never did. Um, something would come up each time to prevent her from going, and so she was always there in Australia. And this eventually was where she died. As an old lady, she had a stroke with her daughter with her and her son-in-law with her once loving family, and she's buried out at the family farm in Camden um, with, with John. 
And in fact, towards the end of this research project, um, I went out to that little cemetery on the family farm. Um, and I'd, I'd been, as I said, I'd been to England and seen where she was born and, and it's about five miles from the beach. And I'd gone to the beach there and I picked up a tiny little seashell, like really ordinary, just a tiny, tiny little seashell. And when I went to her grave, um, I remember what she said to Bridget about collecting shells with Bridget. So I took that seashell and I left it on, on her grave. And it, it was just, you know, I didn't feel her spirit. I didn't see any ghosts or anything, but I felt finished. Yeah. I felt like I'd, 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 I was done. And that and was nice for me. Um, and so that's why I think Elizabeth should be better known because she's been such a player. And I hope you'll want to learn more about her now too because I've only touched on the amazing things that she did, but it's 10 to 8 and I should finish, so I will finish there. Thank you very much. <laughs> choose her in, in the first place? In what oh, as I said, I used to be a public servant mm -hmm. um, and I used to run a grants program um, and I had $50 million to give away for the sale of test trials. <laughs> very popular. Never been so popular in my life. And we're giving grants for rural telecommunications. And so I was out in Outback Queensland um, and dealing with women who live near Longreach. Near Longreach. Yeah. Um, and those women farmers impressed upon me that they weren't farmers' wives that they were farmers in their own right. And I thought I was a feminist, but that was like a light bulb moment for me to go, of course. You know, a family farm is an economic enterprise where the work is gendered, but the input of the women is every bit as important to the family farm as the work of the men. Sometimes it crosses over. And so it got me thinking about why don't I think as women, why don't I think of farmers as women? Why don't I think of Australian farmers as women? And I just started researching and found Elizabeth and went down that rabbit hole very, very happily. That's how I got started. Uh, gentleman here. Oh, um, yes, Michelle, I've got two questions to ask. Um, just recently, I heard a program on the ABC about Elizabeth MacArthur, and they mentioned that she was an accomplished pianist. Uh, and, uh, yeah, hang on. Uh, mm -hmm. When she came out to Australia, she was suffering from depression, and they found, thought, well, if we get her a piano, that might lift it, which it did. And I believe she was responsible for the very first piano coming to Australia. Now, um, I heard that almost. on the ABC. Yeah, so it must be true. <laughs> <laughs> um, almost, almost true. So someone on the first fleet brought out a piano, because when you're going to another country on the other side of the world that no one's ever been to and you're thinking about what you're going to pack, you think, yeah, I need a piano. Um, and it's just a little table piano. They packed. Oh. And so they did bring one out of the first fleet. And when that Marine left to go back to England, he gifted that piano to Elizabeth MacArthur. Yeah, but she and was so, responsible there. So she had, yeah, she had one of the first pianos in the colony, certainly, and they always had a piano in the house. Well, the second one you might now to ask, answer this question. Um, my family come from West Yorkshire, and they come from an area, it's between Bradford and Leeds. It's an area called Shipley, S H I P L E Y. And it's old English for sheep on the leaf. Well, I was over in England just over a decade ago to see my family. Anyway, one day I was walking across a farm and a farmer came and he heard my atrocious Australian <laughs> accent and he said, oh, I know why you're here. Well, was he here to see my family? He said, oh, that's, that's your excuse. He said, he said, the reason why you're here to have a look at the sheep, he said, one of the first lot of sheep came from West Yorkshire, but I don't know the degree of accuracy, but he, he sort of emphasised the it, fact. It, it could well be true. There were other women who were farming sheep at that time too, and women who walked around. There's one woman who walked around Europe for two years collecting sheep, and she started farming in Tasmania during this period. Oh. So there's there's a lot of... Elizabeth's not alone in being a woman farmer. I thought she was going to be on her own, but as I walked through the records, there are heaps of them. A minority, but a sizable minority, and not no one was surprised about them. The government would write about them in their diaries and talk about the wives of or the mothers of, but there were plenty of women farming then as, as there are now. They're there. We just don't necessarily picture them in their minds. Yes, at that the back. Was, that was a great talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I'd love you to say a bit more about why you describe John as brilliant. Because from you know more about it than I do, but it sounds to me like the only 
really smart thing he ever did was marry Elizabeth. <laughs> so where is that judgment coming from? He having him on the ground in London was absolutely critical to the family's success um, because he could the wool came in and he could sell it. So he's quite the salesman. And so they had set that up. When he came back to Australia in the 1820s, the second son, John, took on that role. And so they always had someone on the spot at both ends of the process, someone making the wool and then someone on the other side of the wall were selling the wool. Um, and the fact that he could talk things around and, and talk people around, people either loved him or hated him. Some people did love him, so I sort of want to give him the benefit of the doubt. His children all seemed a bit scared of him. Um, but, yeah, I think you're right that the best thing he did, the smartest thing he did was marrying Elizabeth. And he writes to her about how grateful he is, to be fair, and how much he loves her and he realises how reliant he is on her. Because when he was in London for those eight years, he wasn't making any money. It's all Elizabeth making the money to support him in London, to support the boys at school, to support the family here. She got to the point where her cart wore out um, and another family member had to point out to John that she really needed a new cart to get around in because she wasn't, she didn't want stuff for herself. It was all about setting things up for her family. Um, and her, despite having four sons, only one of them got married and had a child and he had a girl called Elizabeth. Everyone was called Elizabeth. It's really tricky to write about it when everyone's called Elizabeth. Um, and so she had this granddaughter, Elizabeth, and as all the sons died, all the money sort of funneled back to this one granddaughter. She ended up having eight children and, and was widowed quite young, and she became a fabulous farmer as well down at Camden, a prize-winning farmer, and she changed Camden from sheep to dairy. And so this whole, it's a tradition in that family to be women farmers, but again, they're a minority, but they're a big minority. It's, it's not that unusual. Yeah. Um, you know, I come from a historical documents perspective, and I was interested to see here that mm -hmm. they were writing back home. I'm thinking, where are all these historical documents? Are they in you know, public institutions, or are they kept privately by the family still? Or yeah. the, the MacArthur's were very interest, were very aware of their own historical um, importance as being some of the first people in the colony. The children more so than John and Elizabeth. The children, in trying to become gentry, wanted to emphasise their historical importance. So they kept a lot of records, and there are 400 boxes of MacArthur papers in the Mitchell Library in Sydney. Um, and because they're a wealthy family, they're not moving houses, they keep all this stuff. And so they're in the Mitchell Library. I have the copy on CD, but I don't know if those digital copies are available online anymore, but they're, they're all publicly accessible. And that's why we know more about Elizabeth than we do some other families because other families, those papers get lost along the way. And Elizabeth was writing home to Bridget. Um, the original letters are lost, but we have a transcript that her children wrote out, and so we don't know the extent to which they've been edited. She always seems remarkably cheerful in every letter. <laughs> thinking, really? Those first fleet letters or second fleet letters, oh, my eyes just lit up. Well, she kept a journal well, on the second fleet, and hers is the only journal, and it was possibly not written contemporaneously. She might have written it in hindsight and it's clearly for public, for her family at least, to read and, and to know about. It's not like a dear diary sort of journal. So her second fleet journal still exists and, again, that's in the Mitchell Library as well, but it's, I think it's the only second fleet journal that's extant. I've had a letter from the second fleet captain, one of the captains. Oh, yeah, he got jailed. Oh, no, he got... He got one of them. Yeah, he got definitely. tried. Um, for the horrors of the second fleet. Um, Not so, the Neptune was another ship and yeah. him and die. That's about the earliest thing I know in private hands that relates to the fleet. Yeah, but the librarians at the Mitchell Library are spot on and they, they've got all that stuff. Oh, they've got a lot of them. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're responsible for making sure that I don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have a chat to them. The question at the front. Michelle, I was curious, you did a bit of a quantum leap there at one stage saying that John Mort six or ten merinos back from the king. Yeah. Um, but when he arrived, of course, she, before that, she had thousands of sheep. Where were those sheep sourced from? Um, they, they were, they were breeding them up. They, weren't, they were deliberately not eating them. So when small farmers were given sheep, often, they would then kill them for mutton and, and eat them because what else are you going to do with them? Whereas the MacArthur's could afford to keep them and start building up their own herds and building and buying from others. Um, Lots of officers came to the colony for a few years 
and then left. And when they left, they didn't take their sheep with them, so the MacArthur's were able to build them up. Um, by the time Elizabeth had three or 4,000 sheep, she actually had to start culling because she didn't have the staff to look after them. Because they don't have fences, obviously, you need a shepherd to, to bring them in each night and look after them. And she had, as a woman, the governor didn't allocate her as many staff as they would John. So she had trouble looking after those. But they were just little scruffy crossbred sheep that they so got did from they England. come from England, huh? um, Some from England, some from the Cape. So a lot from, and um, they'd bring them down from Batavia and, and Asia as well, so from, from all around the place. Um, and they, they weren't purebreds. And you saw the MacArthur sheep, they're not, they were pretty ordinary sheep, really. The breeding that went on later improved the breed. And the MacArthur's didn't really know about genetics or any of that sort of stuff either. So it's all a bit, bit hit and miss. Um, but the, again, the sheep just happened to take off, but they were still doing other businesses as well. Um, buying and selling horses and cattle and, and trading things. So they had, they had a bit going on. Yeah. So I'm just wondering um, if she was, <coughs> Elizabeth was 79 in that photograph that you showed and her husband, John, was long dead. Yeah. Um, were, <coughs> are there any documents um, showing her reflection as a more mature woman being more honest about her relationship with John? No. No, she was always very circumspect about that. When he died, she didn't go to his funeral, but that's not necessarily unusual for the time. And she waited. It took nine months before she went down to Camden to, to see his grave because she deliberately wanted to go there when no one else was at the house. Because it was on the frontier, people travelling through tended to stay there, and she wanted to make sure that she had some privacy while she was down there. And she talks about weeping on his grave. Um, and... She talks about not being so surprised that he fell into madness. It was like she kind of expected it to come. But, no, she was always very circumspect. And that's the thing about writing, I found about writing biographies, that you never actually know what your subject thinks about. So when you read fiction, it's lovely, isn't it? You get into the characters' heads and you know what they're thinking because the author tells you what they're thinking. But with real-life people, we usually never know what they're thinking. So even if you were to write a diary today, I went to this talk by Michelle and I thought it was awful. Um, you think that today, but next week you might think something different and, and you, your opinions might change over time. So even if you've got something like that written down about what someone thought, as a biography, you have to take it with a grain of salt. But usually, particularly for this period, people don't write about their thoughts and their feelings and because their letters are for public consumption. Mm -hmm. And we can see sometimes Elizabeth would write a letter to Bridget and a letter to her mother, and the story would change slightly between the letters because she's aware of who the audience is. Um, and so finding out what people think and felt as a biographer is really, really difficult, really difficult. Probably the elephant in the room, I suppose, is what's your thoughts of why John MacArthur got all the credit for setting up uh, the wool industry in Australia? Look, I don't think it was him because he was always very happy to say it was Elizabeth um, and his family is certainly aware of her, but I think it's that great man of history, the old, the old way we used to tell history, which was about white men at work. Mm. So Captain Cook, he's a white man at work, isn't he? And the diggers in the goldfields, they're a white man at work and the soldiers of Gallipoli are white men at work. That's how you hear the history. And so... You know, he was supported by his wife and he was helped by his wife. But it did. historians don't come to the material without their own biases and without their own way of seeing the world. Um, and you have to be aware of that as well. And, and, uh, you know, in 100 years' time, someone will write a different biography of Elizabeth and, and do it differently. And in fact, just last week, um, and I can share this with you, it's a bit exciting, a, a filmmaker is thinking about making a film about um, oh, based on my book. Well and he's a First Nations filmmaker. And so the lens that he'll put on it is that frontier lens of using a sympathetic white character to talk about those frontier impacts and connections. And, of course, the, the First Nations characters, he'll, he'll have them as sympathetic as well. So he'll bring a completely different lens to that story. And I think that's really interesting and exciting. It should be great. You mentioned it to me, Michelle. Do you want to tell us what your next project is? Sure. So after I wrote Elizabeth, I was at a bit of a loose end. I didn't have all these ideas popping out of my head like I do now, actually. 
Um, and my agent said to me, do you want to do some ghost writing? And I went, oh, sure. Um, and I ended up writing a memoir with this guy. Yes, he's every bit as handsome as he is. Um, and his name's Aaron Faso, and he's a First Nations actor and film producer and advocate for the Torres Strait. Um, and so it was his memoir, and I, I helped him to write that. So that came out last year, and he and I have now been asked to write a children's book together, a fictional book set in the Torres Strait dealing with the impacts of climate change. So we're actually having a Zoom tomorrow night to get started on that. Um, but the more exciting than even than that is that just I mean, just last week, I had a good week last week, just like last week I went back to my publisher, which is Text Publishing, and they've um, made an offer for my next book, which will be a biography of Louisa Lawson. Um, and she was a poet. She was a farmer as well. She um, bought a little printing press and started up Australia's first journal for women called The Dawn. Um, she was very involved in uh, the suffragette movement and getting women the vote in Australia. And you may be thinking, that name sounds vaguely familiar and you probably know her better as Henry's mother. Mm -hmm. But that's not how I want her to be known or, or introduced. Um, she was a really interesting woman in her own right and Henry got his talents from her. Mm -hmm. um, and so that book is due for publication in 2027, which I haven't started yet. But <laughs> no questions. <laughs> Michelle, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. I do have copies to sell, but I don't care if you don't buy one. If you just want to come up and say, have a chat and ask questions, because it's hard asking questions in this, I'm more than happy to have a chat. If you'd like to buy a copy, that's fine. If not, the library has copies and they're free. So, you know, support your local library. Um, and Feel free to come and say hi. Thank you very, very much. I'll Stories to tell. There's also events going on in uh, mornings and afternoons, uh, book clubs, the interest groups, book sale, book sale on Saturday, which 